It's a machine. It was my friend Daniel Beauchamp and I, we had this long running joke about a proud parent machine that you could give a quarter and it pats you on the shoulder and says, proud of you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I still have that hanging on my wall in my workshop. So that one I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with. I just think it's a really funny concept and also I executed the build well. So it's an arm? Mm-hmm. Like what's the build? Yeah, I built it off of an old lamp arm. Yeah, basically it's just a motorized arm and this kind of torso of a person. Mm-hmm. Well, so, so it's actually a hand, right? It's just laser cut plywood and it kind of has like, it, it looks creepy. Yeah. And yeah, it says proud of you, son. Because I just thought that sounded more funny than proud of you, daughter. And also proud of you, son, just it immediately communicates that it's a parent. It's not just like a collie or something. It's like proud of you. <laughs> yeah. And it charges you a quarter for it. Yeah, but he added like chat GPT on top of that and uh, fine tune it on conversations you've had with your parents and all of a sudden you have a thing that can fundamentally transform your psyche. Yeah. The following is a conversation with Simone Yetch, an inventor, designer, engineer, and roboticist famous for a combination of humor and brilliant creative design in the systems and products she creates, including as part of her new product design company called Yetch. She has a popular YouTube channel where she has demonstrated a lot of her incredible and fun designs and inventions from, quote, shitty robots to a Tesla Model 3 converted into a truck, but where she also revealed her personal journey after having been diagnosed with a brain tumor. Simone is a brilliant, fun, and inspiring human being. It was truly an honor for me to get to meet her and to have this chat. This is the Lex Friedman Podcast. To support it, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, dear friends, here's Simone Yetch. What was the first cool thing you built where you fell in love with the process of making stuff? You know, I think in the beginning of building stuff, you you run into the limitations of your skills so much. So I feel like, honestly, building gets less and less frustrating. Or, like, I love it more and more, the more I know. So the limitations aren't fun? Like when it's the really limitations are fun, but it's like when you have an idea of something and you want to make it a certain level and then you just yeah. have to compromise with the materials and the tools and the skills you have. Um, so I can't remember first time where I felt like. I'm proud of this. Wow. This was so smooth. I'm so proud of it. Like I feel like. A lot of people, I watch them build stuff, and it's just like watching water pour down. You know, it's just like so easy. And for me, it's just like trying to shove a toy car into a wall. So you're not able to step back and marvel like at the early creations, even like, even like, um, we're not even talking the Arduino stuff even before then. I'm from Sweden. And you have to choose either sewing or woodworking. And I chose so, like woodworking in middle school. And I remember the sense of pride when I got to bring something home and that thing of like, oh my God, I get to show my parents this. And I think that is kind of the feeling that I've built my job around. It's like the sense of pride and wanting to show people something that I made. And like back then it was like a little wooden spoon, you know, and now it's a slightly larger Wooden spoon. Wooden spoon yeah. that is dynamic <laughs> and moves and has an, a mind of its own. Um, you first started doing more engineering type stuff with uh, Arduino boards at Punch Through Design, which mm-hmm. is an SF engineering firm. What are, just from your memory there, what are some cool things you built there? So the thing is, I, I went to advertising school and I just like a vocational studies a year. And I realized there that I didn't care much for advertising, but I thought it was really fun to build stuff and program. So like I just completely focused on that. And there I built my first hardware project or like electronics project, which was this uh, iPhone case with retractable guitar strings. Yeah. So basically I imagined that you could like pull out guitar strings from the bottom of your iPhone and you could pluck it to your belt and then you could hold a cord on the screen. Mm-hmm. And I built that together with my friend Jonathan and I was like, oh, this is dope. I thought it was so much fun. And I considered like, oh, should I go to school for this? But then I thought, hmm, maybe I can get a job and I could get paid to learn about electronics. So 
just based off of that one project, I got the job at Punch Through Design, which actually was a was one year internship. Can you explain what we're talking about here? So it's a case mm -hmm. with guitar strings attached. Yeah. To it. Does it actually work at all? It does. These are not on the screen guitar strings. No. They're actual... So they're actual strings that you pull out. So there's a mechanism that's almost like a seatbelt mechanism. And yeah, you pull them out from the bottom of uh, your phone and you can attach them to your belt. I mean, it's terrible. Okay. There's a few different ways to decide if somebody's touching a guitar string. Mm -hmm. And what you do in a real guitar is you have the little, it's like measuring the vibration or the change in the, as, as the, yeah, you're measuring how the guitar is vibrating. And you can't really do that because I can't have a, a, a receiving sensor because the guitar strings are going to move in relationship to that because you don't have like a rigid neck. And this is like, yeah, this was my first electronics project. I was a little fledging baby maker. But what I decided was to use capacitive touch because that is independent on if the guitar strings are moving in relationship to something or in relation to something. So basically, there was just this little Bluetooth Arduino board that this company, Punch Through Design, made. So that was how I found them. And I measured the capacitive touch. So like whenever um, the guitar string was measured, there was this little microcontroller that was like, oh my god, a guitar string got measured or touched. And then that sent a signal over Bluetooth to my phone, and I'd built a little iPhone app that interpreted those Bluetooth signals and then checked what type of chord I was holding on the screen and then played the coherent right, So sound. you're holding the chords on the screen. screen so you're doing the multi-touch sensing there. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. I honestly cannot believe that I pulled it off because I, I think I was, I was, ignorance was definitely bliss. Because that was like, yeah, the first hardware project I'd ever built, the first iPhone app I'd ever programmed. And like now, if somebody was like, hey, I want this to be my first project, I would probably be like, oh, that's a lot. But I well, can, pulled can, it off. Because that's, a, that's such an interesting thing for people to hear because it's your first project. And a lot mm -hmm. of people stop because of the difficulty of their first project. They never truly discover their own genius because they stop at the first and you didn't stop. So it'd be interesting to kind of psychoanalyze you on the couch of why you didn't stop. Because you have to build an app you yeah. have to figure out how to, did you know how to program much or no? no. Okay. I mean, a little bit, but I never programmed in, or done any iOS apps. Okay, so you have to figure out how to get, forget like what the app does, just get the app running and working. Mm -hmm. And then you have to figure out how to get the sensors in like real time, the finger touching. And you have to connect how to get the, cap the capacitor touch working with the microcontrollers. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about the ca capacitor touch sensors at yeah. that time? I mean, it's pretty easy um, yeah. now. It's basically- Everything just, is easy. Yeah. You know, rockets are pretty easy. Hey. You sound like my grandma. She's I have an Italian grandma. <laughs> and uh, I'm always trying to get her, we're like trying to get her to tell her recipes and yeah. every recipe starts with it's very simple yeah and then there's like 45 minutes of her explaining it yeah. it's like with gymnastics at the olympics they make it look easy the best people in the world always make the the, the impossible seem easy i pride myself with making buildings so look really hard because <laughs> i feel like i'm always struggling so much <laughs> you make the easy seem impossible <laughs> yeah. no uh but... I guess. So how many strings was it? Was it just one? Oh, uh, gosh. I mean, this is such a long time ago. No, it was six. Oh, six strings, and you could yeah. touch it, and then there's, wow. And it can, and then the, the phone itself makes a sound? Uh-huh. And I, wow. still, I still think it's such a cool concept to have this, like, mobile. You know, I'm not even a guitar player. I don't know. I was, I mean, I got the idea because I was uh, kind of strumming on my charge cord of my phone. Oh, like an air guitar, but on a chord? Yeah. But I, I've been thinking about it because I'm like, oh, man, it would be really fun to go back to that project with what I know now. But the problem with it is that when you're producing the tension in your string just with your arm, like you can't make it taut enough to actually play. Like yeah. it kind of becomes playing these like saggy strings. Yep. So it's you're not really getting that experience. And I think that's why, I mean, I... Yeah, I haven't really pursued it. I wonder it. if there's a way to generate the tightness from the case itself. 
It's like a device that unfolds and then with some kind of tightening mechanisms. Tightens. Yeah, but then it kind of becomes this like whole thing in a guitar. Yeah. Then it just becomes a really shitty guitar. Yeah. Like, which this is a really shitty guitar, but it's also But it's not a so shitty, it's awesome. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but it's a cool. It's cool that you have an interface between a device that's capable of incredible computational power mm -hmm. and an actual hardware thing. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you can psychoanalyze that made you finish that others could hear in, in their own struggle to uh, do their first project like that? Because you were not, you were a non-engineering person technically, and you did a pretty cool renegade out there, wild, no instructions, engineering project. No, it's definitely, it was an off-road build where it's like, if you're building a Lego kit, it's very much on the road and you're following instructions. And this is like, you have no idea if you're headed for a cliff or a dead end or you're going to get stuck. Um, I think it had a natural pressure to it because it was a school project. So it did have deadlines built into it and, and stuff like that. So that definitely helped. But I think also it was just so incredibly motivating when I realized that I might be able to pull it off. Yeah. Like that was, I, I felt like a bloodhound, you know, <laughs> you're just like, oh my God, I can actually make this happen. And I think if I hadn't seen that at the horizon, it would have been harder to stick through. Were you able to see the end of the tunnel? Um pretty early on no not really <laughs> I mean, I feel like so there's something clearly. to just suffering for a while i don't know how how your brain works but it's like if i have a problem i can't stop thinking about it like it's so fun to think about it like i spent i spent two and a half years designing a coat hanger and I just can't stop thinking about it. Like I get so into it because I think it's so much fun. Take me to this two-year journey of the coat hanger. <laughs> the coat hanger. What? <laughs> like, how did it begin? How did it begin? It began with a corner in my home where I couldn't fit a coat rack. The thing is, I shouldn't have brought this up because I'm going to release it as a product probably in a year. Oh, an actual product. Mm -hmm. Okay. So well, that's a let's leave it as a mystery. It's a mystery, yeah. But it's, it solves a fundamental problem in in the human yes! condition. And I am so excited about it. And I cannot, I don't, the, yeah, but this is, I get so mm -hmm. pumped about it because I see it's just this issue or like this problem that I want to solve. And I, I kind of can't put it to rest until I have. It's, I mean, speaking of cone hangers, um, doorknobs have always been interesting to me. It's cool how how there's things that everybody uses that somebody designed. Lex. Yeah. Oh my god. So okay. So this is I. So I have I have two like big. So basically, I started on YouTube and I'm uh, been doing that for like the last seven or eight years, and I've kind of been thinking of like, okay, what's next for me? Because I want to keep on trying out new things, and I've, I'm I'm kind of going into two different avenues. One is the product business that I started. Code hinders, TBD. Um, and then I am working on a pilot episode of a show where each episode is about an everyday object and why oh, they look nice. the way that they do. So we've written a pilot episode about forks. And it's all about, like, why do they look the way that they do? That's why so did awesome. this became the, like, eating implement of the West? Why are we ruled by an iron fork? How did yeah. that happen? And every everyday object that you have and that you just take for granted, somebody just made it up. Yeah. We're all sheep. We all keep using it. Yeah. Even if it's not optimal. I mean, presumably most objects are optimal, you hope, or They're at least a local not. optimal. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I think is so like the world around us. And this is why I love building things is because it just opens up this idea that the world around us is so malleable mm -hmm. and you can make objects work for you better. Like I spent, I, I made this fruit bowl. I had a fruit bowl and I was always annoyed that I had either too little or too much fruit for it. Mm -hmm. So I made a fruit bowl where I can change the diameter of it. It has a mechanism so you can like make it bigger or smaller. And that's just like the thing of being like bowls. Why are they the way that they are? I yeah. can make them different. And I think like I want to make an episode about doorknobs. I think it's so interesting. Why are they the way they are? Why are they placed the way where they are? I, what, I think that's going to be a rabbit hole from which you will never return. I would happily live in that rabbit hole forever. 
like if I can if I can like dig out a little niche for myself there because I think it's like you know they go so deep. They're also on different sides of doors. You never like the push pull situation Mm -hmm. on doors in general. Mm -hmm. Like that's one of the main problems of humanity. Is figuring push, out pull the push pull, figuring <laughs> yeah. out which it is embarrassing. It's, it's yeah. just okay. How many? There's eight billion people on people on Earth. Every single second, there is millions of people being embarrassed by the confusion of what real the push live pull. stats. Right now, there's lives. somebody, yeah. some guy, first time in college, he's trying to be impressive to everybody. He pushes on, a, mm-hmm. and, and he plays it off like it's cool. Oh shit! I, I knew that. No, but over that's and, the thing. Over. and it affects our behaviors. That yeah. was why I think it's so interesting with forks is that forks actually affect our eating behaviors. Mm-hmm. And they can get you to eat faster or slower, take bigger bites or smaller bites. And there are all these ways or like the social. I mean, the reason that um, chopsticks work is because they do the food chopping in the kitchen mm-hmm. rather than on the plate. And also you have a bowl that you bring to your mouth with, whereas a plate you keep on the, like there are just all these ways and these objects affect our behavior, opening and closing doors. And I think it's such an interesting take on culture through and like human behavior through these objects that we use every day and we never question them really. Yeah. And then there's institutions that are controlling our mind that don't want us to know the truth. Why are sports not more popular? Have you asked yourself that question? Yeah, no, it's all big utensil is behind (laughs) all of it. (laughs) All right. So, I mean, in those early days, um, did you suffer from imposter syndrome? Like that leap to being an engineer. Was was there, especially when you started uh, working a bunch of the design on a team of engineers, was there insecurity? Both yes and no. I think I've... um, I always try to flip my flaws into selling points. And for that, so getting that job, I I was like, oh, you're a team of engineers. Everybody working here is an engineer. Your customers are not all engineers. You need somebody who can be your filter and tell you when something's going to be too hard for your customers to understand. So it was more me being like, oh, no, it might seem that me not having skills is a bad thing. But actually, it's a great thing. I need it. (laughs) I represent the everyday person. I understand deeply (laughs) Deeply. what everybody (laughs) needs and wants. Yes, that is me, the representation of the the average human. but I mean, I, I remember that. So I studied physics for a year in college and then I dropped out. And I had this rule for myself that whenever I did not understand any something, I would ask a question. So I was always raising my hand in class. And it's this room, entire like auditorium filled with incredibly intelligent people who are mortified of seeming stupid. Yeah. And I think that was really like, and I remember people at the end of the year coming up to me and being like, Thank you so much for all the questions you asked, because whenever there was something that I was too scared to ask, you always raised your hand. So I think it is a bit of a skill. And I think that is kind of how I channel my imposter syndrome is I'm just like, no, let's lay it all out there. (laughs) So you're okay being almost like self-deprecating, just coming off. I mean, I'm definitely that. I I kind of lean into, I call myself an idiot. I lean into Mm -hmm. being stupid. I think not all heroes wear capes. And the guy and girl who asks the stupid question is everybody's hero, I th- including the pr- teachers. Yeah. I think it's it's both. It's a double-edged sword. I started out on the internet, kind of, I kind of got the moniker, the queen of shitty robots, because I posted a lot of stuff on slash r slash shitty robots on Reddit, and people started calling me the queen of slash r slash shitty robots, and then the slash r kind of dropped. So I, what I'm trying to say is I did not come up with that with myself. Um, but I did happily adopt it. So I definitely came from a place of like building things that didn't work and kind of, yeah, everything going wrong every time, like happily failing. And I think that was amazing. It was a really powerful tool for me to like not get my perfectionism in the way because if I set out to do something that's great, then I'm never going to start. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, I just need something that looks funny. Um but what I've realized now is that it was also a defense mechanism 
being self-deprecating is like always beating people to the punch. It kind of was a survival tactic on the internet of being like never daring to set out as an expert. And I still do that. Like I'm terrified to tell people how to do something, even if I know, um, because it kind of opens you up for being shot down. So I think I have, I definitely have a conflicted relationship with it. And now, especially as I'm, I'm getting older, I am more skilled than I was before. I mean, I'm a CEO of three businesses and I'm like, I don't need to like keep on talking myself down all the time. So yeah, I think it's definitely something that has served me really, really well. And that is still like a thing that I have in my work life and in my relationships, but I'm also trying to only do it when it's beneficial to me and not when it's harmful. Yeah, I mean, but when you're as successful as you are, I feel like people like it when you're self-deprecating and you don't take yourself seriously, you have that yeah. humility. Uh, I think it's probably the hardest when you're starting out. Yeah. Cause I don't know. I think no, it was easier then almost, I don't know. But nobody takes you seriously, right? And when you're starting out, when you're young, like. You know, I just realized that I played a lot more stupid than I was and yeah. I think it's also, oh gosh, I can't believe I'm the one bringing this up, uh, but like being a woman in a male-dominated field mm -hmm. and you're like trying, I was just trying to make myself the least amount threatening or like really unthreatening because people are threatened by you in different ways. And it's like, you have such a thin line that you can walk where you're like, okay, I need to be just attractive enough for people to not be offended by my appearance, but just unattractive enough for people to not sexualize me. I have to be just smart and witty enough for people to be like, oh my God, that's really cool. But also shoot myself down enough for other people not to be able to do it or be like, oh yeah, watch this woman try to thinking that she knows how to build electronics, you know? So it's like... That's a interesting skill to build, especially when you put yourself out there on the internet. Yeah. Like, unfortunately, that's the reality of the internet. And it's a skill you have to kind of develop. And it's actually why a lot of really brilliant people avoid the internet. Yeah. Like there's not many people, like at MIT, for example, there's not many brilliant professors or PhD students and so on just putting their stuff out there. Because like, <laughs> um, if they, what, like if they really put their heart and soul into a thing, first of all, that's really hard. Mm -hmm. And nobody nobody sees it and everyone's like, eh, this is boring. So there's so many failure modes, like this is boring. Or like, like you said, you're coming off as too much of an expert, you're not self-deprecating enough. Mm -hmm. Or like there's just so many failure modes and it's terrifying for people. But I feel like that's a skill you should learn because most people like at MIT, at university and so on are doing a lot of awesome stuff. Yeah. And they should show it off. But I feel like you figured out a really good process of of showing it off. You've, when you fail, when you succeed, all of it, not taking yourself too seriously, but also revealing through the humor and the self-deprecation, a kind of genius, a kind of intelligence and curiosity can I just want to snapshot that quote and put it on my LinkedIn on the back profile of your book. and the back when of my When is your book? autobiography coming out? Oh, never. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to say that because like a year from now. Oh gosh, I don't want to, I don't want to shit on autobiographies. Yeah. No. No. But even no. just by saying that I'm shitting on autobiographies. I just, me being interested enough in somebody to want to read 600 pages about them talking about themselves. It's a, no, oh. well, <laughs> well, that's exactly the kind of person that should write one. But, but also, I'm fucking 32 years old. What do I have to I'm write about? Like, I went through puberty, I lost my virginity, and here we are. Like, I don't know. It's like such a... <laughs> Three chapters. It's a, yeah. it's a coloring book. Okay. <laughs> Chapter seven. I learned to tie my own shoelaces. <laughs> I feel like it would be awesome. Anyway, what's the uh, the queen? So how did you achieve the status of royalty? The queen of shitty robots. What's the origin story there? I I mean I have officially renounced my title now. Can you still speak of the time when you led? I can still speak of the time. Your kingdom. Yes. Uh no, I mean it started on because I Did you rule by love or fear? By fear of rejection mm, from me deep. that people <laughs> would reject me. So I um uh, yeah, I started making these little gifts. Like my the early projects that I did were very gift forward. 
It was always like I only did it because it could be translated into a GIF. GIF forward. I like it. Yeah. But honestly, <laughs> it was like it's a really good mental exercise to vet if your project is easy enough to be explained by like a seven second looping video without audio. And because like nobody's going to care that it also has Bluetooth. Yeah. Like it's really like, is it, is it self-explanatory enough to um, be explained through a GIF? So yeah. I could just pause. I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, I feel like all scientific papers and projects should go through that exercise. <laughs> Can it How be explained as a GIF? <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, DeepMind does a good job of this. Like, you know, this we've saw protein folding. Here's a GIF. <laughs> That's literally what they do. Yeah. Because who is going to read the nature paper? Mm -hmm. So like this, you have to, like, how do we communicate this visually in a sexy, clean way where people can intuitively understand, even if you don't know what a protein is, even if you don't know what protein folding is. Yeah. It's no, a cool it's exercise. it's very like, yeah, if somebody comes out of context, and that's been really interesting also, like, building this product business and trying to do the marketing around that. And I'm like, if somebody comes in and they have no idea about what this product is, will they get it explained to them in this ad? And I, I don't know. But it's definitely a worthwhile exercise to do. So I started making these projects that got translated into GIFs. And I posted them on slash r slash shitty robots on Reddit. So that subreddit existed? Yeah. And I loved it. I thought it was really fun. And I was like, I want to contribute with content here. Conquered it. I don't. I mean, okay. I don't know. I was Through voted. I think I was voted top user of 2015. So, oh. yeah, that's an old merit. But Once you win a Nobel yeah. Prize, you always have the Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, what was the first? Do you remember the early gifts that you created? So this is when I was at Punch Through Design in San Francisco. I was kind of building a lot of hardware projects for them, but I also felt, and they were so supportive of me, but I also, it's such a different way representing a brand versus representing yourself. So there were some projects that I just like ruled out because I was like, this feels too weird for this brand. And I started building them on the side. One of them was a toothbrush helmet. And yeah, so it's like a skateboard helmet with a robot arm on the forehead, kind of like a unicorn horn, mm -hmm. and it brushes your teeth for you. Was that the first YouTube video you uploaded? It was the first gift that I uploaded. So actually, I wanted to, um, I wanted to do a kids show about electronics in Sweden because I was like, I love electronics. I think it's fucking dope. I could do a kids show about it. So I sh filmed this terrible, terrible pilot episode uh -huh. in my bedroom in San Francisco. And that's when I built the toothbrush helmet and I emailed it to them. I mean, just cold email, like I had no in or anything. But I was like, hey, I want to do this. And um, they didn't get back to me. Nobody surprised. And I was like, well, I have this thing I built, I might as well post it on the internet. So that's why I made the little GIF and I posted it on slash r slash shitty robots. And I think it got like 50,000 views. And I was like, oh. wow. And from there, I just kept on building things. And I think within six months, it was my full-time job. Can you go through the detailed design of this toothbrush helmet? <laughs> There's a motor... <laughs> It's like a server, like what? What? How, what's the motor? What's the, is an Arduino involved? Yeah, so I built it off of um, this robot arm called Me Arm. So it's just this acrylic robot arm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it has three servo motors. And it's all controlled by an Arduino, all the so electronics. So the arm is already pre-built? It was a kit, so I assembled it. How do you make sure it, the the length of the arm is the proper... I mean, the uh, arm came down, so it's like... Yeah. I mean, I just programmed it to come down to my mouth and then poorly brush my front teeth. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just swung back and forth. I mean... <laughs> Trial and error is Trial how Trial and error? That. What was the yeah. challenges of that? Do you remember? Oh, gosh. Or was that one not uh, much of a struggle? The challenge... No, it was definitely a struggle. Because um, also, how do you loop it with a nice GIF? I mean, it loops. It loops fine. Yeah, it loops it's pretty like, fine. Yeah. Is that, that's, not, that's not that hard? Uh, no, I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's a GIF. It's the internet. Things yeah. are shitty all the time. I think, I mean, I think the biggest struggle of that was that I had this intention for it to be this show and then them not <laughs> giving. Oh, yeah. Yeah, giving back. And I was like, was well, if they don't want it, 
then <laughs> maybe YouTube will have me. They don't notice my genius yet. What was yep. what was so bad about the pilot? Do you remember? What's oh, like the worst, most embarrassing? So cringy. Yeah, I mean, it's thankfully not on the internet, so nobody can find it. But it's very much me being in what I called host mode, which is where I'm like, okay, so what we're going to learn yeah. today is that we're yeah. going to look at this. This is something called a servo motor, yeah. and it's like the intonation and everything is really different. And I'm actually, I mean, I thinking back of that, I'm so happy that they didn't get back to me because it's such a different thing to kind of start your career in your living room, running back and forth to the camera and like filming something and then looking at it. And like, I got to really find my own voice in a different way. And then like a year later, they offered me a show, but then I was so off and running. I was like, no, I don't want to do this. Mm. You didn't fall into that place of being like a actor, like a YouTuber, where you're presenting a kind of personality. You're more focused on the product you're creating. I mean, I think it's a combination of it. I mean, I, I, I think of it as acting sometimes, but I only play the role of myself. But of course, it's like when you're shooting something for the seventh time, yeah. Like you have to be able to muster that enthusiasm. But no, it's not. I kind of think of everyday life me as a watered down version of the YouTube version. It's like. That's a cheap knockoff. Yeah, the wish.com <laughs> version. No, it's just like add a few parts water if you have me. <laughs> Uh, but like on YouTube, it's just so condensed because you have jump cuts and, you know, like yeah. I'll script jokes and make sure that everything lands and there's music and stuff. And then like in real life, you don't have any of that, but it's still me. Uh, what are some other cool robots uh, in the early days that stand out to you? I mean, there's a million we can go through, but like <laughs> what, um, may maybe what, what was like a challenging one, like a really challenging one in, in the early days? I mean, I remember the breakfast robot, which was my second project, was a challenging one. So it eating cereal? Yeah, it's a robot that like pours milk and cereal and feeds me at, with a spoon. I was mostly challenging because it was so like everything had to be in the right location. And there were so many takes before I got everything right. Mm -hmm. And by right, I mean it makes an absolute mess. Um, yeah, that one was challenging. How but many takes was that one? I don't know, probably 12. It's just a mess everywhere. It's a mess. And also I use like Cheerios for the cereals. And my it's shot in my old bedroom in San Francisco. And it, the floors were sticky for weeks afterwards. Do you think goes into your autobiography? Yeah. Good. It's nice. <laughs> we can two. just type out this podcast and <laughs> I'll release it as a and my GPT. manager would be stoked. We'll fix it in post. Um yeah, this the the feed because you have like a couple of feeding ones, right? The soup. Isn't there a soup one? Yeah, there's a soup robot. Um, there's a beer pouring robot. Yeah. I mean, that's that's awesome. That's a difficult robotics problem in the shitty and the in the perfect version of having an arm that interacts intimately with a human being. Mm -hmm. And one of the most intimate things you can do with a human being, that's PG, is to yes. feed it. <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> where is he going with this? Uh, <laughs> oh my no. God, he's a YouTube comic come live. <laughs> like, yeah. like, damn it. So like, to me, there's a, like feeding is tricky. Or even like getting a beer, even pouring a beer is, is tough mm -hmm. into a glass. Yeah, it's trickier than anyone who hasn't tried it thinks. And even making it, I think what I realized is that like, making things really shitty or like failing in a spectacular way is also its own sort of skill because like the shittiest robot is the one that doesn't turn on right. but like that isn't much to watch so it was always like wanting for it to fail in these kind of spectacular ways um no there's a lot of stuff to be said about engineering in it is there something to be said on a philosophical level about the value of a flawed robot so like the kind of robots you want is to be partially flawed. Like, do you think the kind of robots we'll have in the home mm -hmm. that are friends and, um, you know, almost like pets, wouldn't they need to be kind of shitty? Because we can love the, somehow we humans love the shitty. I mean, it is kind of endearing and because I think it, it kind of, I'm going to mess up this world word, anthropomorphizes them. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I mean, I never feel as deeply connected to my Roomba as when it's like 
I'm on a cliff. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, babe. Have like, you had Roombas talk? Tiny ledge. No. I really, yeah, I've done that a lot. Yeah. When they talk to you. Yeah. And it, it, it immediately anthropomorphizes them. Yeah. And then you have, if they have a name, which is why most roboticists don't give names or gender to robots because you, you, you become connected to them. I'm of the opposite mind. You should have like an in, intimate relationship sounds weird, but you should have a close <laughs> connection to robots. I mean, there there's power in that. There's a social element to robotics, even a arm. I don't know. There's something about us humans that gains so much value from our interaction with dynamic objects. And we should like lean into that as opposed to run away from it. That, that was always the confusing thing to me about robotics is that most roboticists run away from that. Yeah. It's weird. Because it's obviously gonna be, robots are obviously going to be everywhere. Yeah. Obviously. But it's also humans are sensitive and squishy and there's so much liability. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but the humans are sensitive and squishy when they interact with each other and they hurt each other all the time. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes they get together and they're like, oh, you're the best. You no, know, you're the best. And then they leave each other and then they break each other's heart. Sorry about your breakup, Lex. I didn't yeah, know I'm you just were trying to get over this. <laughs> I'm actually drunk for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been able to Have sleep for nights. Have you slept nice. all night? I have not. <laughs> but from a safety protocol perspective, people think about like physical damage, not emotional damage. I know this sounds ridiculous. I know this sounds ridiculous, but it won't be. It's already happening. There's an app called Replica where people have an intimate relationship with an AI chatbot and they hurt themselves. I was thinking about this. Yeah. Okay. In dating, mm -hmm. what if you, because you can train like a chat bot to kind of mimic the way that you talk to people and interact with people. Go on. Yeah, but then I'm like, okay, but what if we could all make AI versions of ourselves and have them date yeah. like thousands and thousands of other AI people and have that as a way to turn out potential potential candidates? Like, I feel like that's gonna be what's the what's the yeah what's the what <laughs> no, but what's what? the point of like meeting? 20 people if you're like oh but if we just had our ai versions of ourselves interact they'd be like oh your your method of conflict is not going to match or what if the ai version of you like sleeps around with all the other ais and becomes famous for that and it starts its own only fans and then it become and you're like what did you do you come yeah. back home you'd realize like i don't i didn't want to create a monster create a monster i and mean then... do i get a cut <laughs> exactly that's the question <laughs> yeah. i'd be asking but I think it's definitely like, yeah, the, the human technology interaction is really interesting because I feel like I don't love any of the machines that I have in my life. Oh, really? You haven't, you haven't? I mean, I don't love my phone. I touch it all the time and it's there and it's like constantly, it's a constant presence, but there's nothing in me that feels like, oh, I love this object. So like I kind of despise it. Well, that, that might be the way you show love. I don't know. Yeah. That's a deeper, <laughs> yeah. that's another psychoanalysis thing. Uh, so you don't, there's not robots whom you've taken apart that you miss? No, they're all terrible. I mean, I, I have objects that I built that I love. Mm -hmm. um, none of the robots, I think, but that's also because it was a different, that was a different era where I wasn't really putting a lot of care into the projects I built. So the more care you put into it, into the design to actually make it look to make it functional and look good, that's where you put the love in. Yeah. I mean, it is. It's like, I feel like any technology company that figures out a way to get you to actually genuinely love your Roomba or like love it in the way that you would love a pet, there's a lot to be gained. Yeah. And I think it's scary, mm -hmm. depending on who the company is, because mm -hmm. then they can manipulate you. Yeah. If you, if you love your Roomba, and all of a sudden, your Roomba starts telling you to buy stuff. Yeah. Or it's to, leaving. To put lotion on Jeff Bezos' head. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where the lotion came in, but yes, maybe I buy know. certain things. I just, <laughs> I just imagine my Amazon Echo being like, hey, <laughs> hey, Jeff Bezos is really a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> but even though you haven't, do you think it's possible to fall in love with a robot? Yeah. I mean, people fall in love with things all the time. Well, people have fallen in love with your shitty robots, probably. I, I guarantee you there's people listening to this 
that are a little bit heartbroken saying that you've never fallen in love with your shitty robot. <laughs> They're like, but I had a relationship, like I had an emotional connection to that robot. Like the one with it with a parent, pats you on the back. Oh, that one. That one I do like. I like that one a lot. Um, that's probably my favorite, like, shitty robot. Can you explain it? So it's a machine. It was my friend Daniel Beauchamp and I. We had this long-running joke about a proud parent machine that you could give a quarter and it pats you on the shoulder and says, proud of you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I still have that hanging on my wall in my workshop. So that one I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with. I just think it's a really funny concept and also i executed the build well so that was so it's an arm mm -hmm. like what's the build yeah i built it off of an old lamp arm yeah basically it's just a motorized arm and this kind of torso of of a person mm -hmm. well, so, so it's actually a hand right it's I not a, it correctly it's, it's, it's like a laser cut it's just laser cut plywood and it kind of has like it, it looks creepy yeah which i like yeah, the creepy yeah. helps with the... Yeah. And yeah, it says, proud of you, son. Because I just thought that sounded more funny than proud of you, daughter. And also, proud of you, son, just... It immediately communicates that it's a parent. It's not just like a colleague or something. It's like, proud of you. <laughs> yeah. And it charges you a quarter for it. Yeah, but he added like chat GPT on top of that and uh, fine tune it on conversations you've had with your parents. And all of a sudden, you have a thing... It can fundamentally transform your psyche. Yeah. That's all it takes. That's a beautiful creation. How'd you come up with that creation? Oh, it was my friend Daniel and I who had a long running joke about it. High level, can you speak to your creative process? I think a lot of it, I mean, it's changed. For the Shady Robots, that's actually separate. For the separate. Shady Robot, yeah. I mean, it, it has a lot of overlap. Um, so it's identifying everyday problems. And in the Shitty Robot era, I would kind of take an everyday problem like, oh, I have a hard time getting up in the morning and I would solve it in the most ridiculous, spectacular way I could think of. So for waking up in the morning, it was having an alarm clock that slaps me in the face with a rubber hand. Mm -hmm. And what I'm doing now is still identifying everyday problems, but I'm actually trying to like product design my way out of it. What in your experience was the funniest thing? Is it violence, like the hand slapping you? Food eating is there, is, or is it just uh, I case about it? The funniest is no. I think it's more like the proud parent machine. It's not violent. It doesn't. Yeah, there's no nothing. It's just emotional, and it's yeah. kind of a commentary on this fraught relationship that we sometimes have with our parents, and they're proud of us. Sometimes, every time. Sometimes, my dad visited like last week, and he was like, "I just want to say I'm so proud of you, and for the built." life you built for yourself. And that yeah. was really sweet. Yeah. I'll really put kind. that on the back of my autobiography too. Yeah. It's not your fault, Simone. <laughs> it's not your fault. Some stuff is my fault. <laughs> what was the longest one to complete for the Shady Robots that you remember? Because you spent, on a few of them, you spent quite a long time. Mm -hmm. mm. Which is also inspiring when you take so long in a project. Yeah. I think... Um, Kind of in the more like fun, whimsical department rather than shitty robots. I built recently um, this music box. So like a small music box that kind of has a barrel mm -hmm. with little spikes and it plays a song. But I did a large version of that that pops a sheet of bubble wrap and then like plays tones into a pan flute. So yeah, you can actually program it to play different songs. That one kicked my butt in so many creative ways and it was such a pain. I think that is probably the like weird funny project that's taken me the longest and like the biggest engineering effort where's the all sound coming from so if you it all came from me realizing that if you pop bubble wrap and you pop it right in front of the opening of a pan flute or like one of the pipes you can have it play different tones so that's what it does so i built this <laughs> music instrument off of that okay it if it's okay, can you describe some, some like how it works, some of the, the, the technical details here? Yeah, it's so basically, I mean, one of the big issues that I had, so I worked with, um, as of a year and a half back, I hired an engineer, Stu, so we were collaborating on it. Um, but a big issue that we had was feeding in the bubble wrap sheet and like uh -huh. making sure that it feeds in straight and doesn't get skewed because you need to make like the popping feet 
which is where you program this barrel to pop different bubbles, mm -hmm. need to be so perfectly aligned on the bubble of the bubble wrap for it to pop in the right location. So there's a feeder for the bubble wrap. That's a challenge. And then mm -hmm. you have to have a barrel with the, f the little baby feet on it yeah. that pops the bubble so wrap. That Why is it so exciting? That barrel <laughs> was a <laughs> pain yeah. as well. I had to get a like this rotary set up for my CNC and yeah, it was it was a lot of work. Um but that was really fun and it's just like this is probably my favorite privilege of my job is that I can go down any rabbit hole I think find interesting. Did you have a lot of joy from popping the Mhm. Mm the, yeah, the, that's fine. The bubbles. It's a lot of self-soothing. And like I got to spend, I think I spent a week trying to figure out the best material to pop bubble wrap with. Because if you have two, if you kind of put them two, two through uh, or through, if you put a sheet of bubble wrap through two rigid tubes, mm -hmm. the air kind of just escapes from one side of the bubble into the other. So wow. what I realized was that if you have a squishy material, like kind of a yoga mat material mm -hmm. in between it, it actually, it prevents that and pops it a lot more reliably. So but you, like increasing the pop reliability was a huge effort as well. You have to pop a squishy thing with another squishy thing. Because you don't need a lot of force. Yeah. Like you just need it to not, the air to not be able to escape anywhere. Wow. But then also we had, there was different qualities of bubble wrap where there was a lot of transference between different bubbles. So instead of the bubble popping, it would just seep the air into a neighboring bubble and that like membrane would kind of, so, you know, I, I just like getting to spend weeks on weeks of just studying bubble wrap. <laughs> Did you ever think about like publishing academic work on bubble wrap? No. Wouldn't that be epic? Because nobody's done this. I bet you nobody's done squishing it. Squishy material on squ squishy versus squishy <laughs> for popping. I bet somebody has, but you know, I I always I thought I was going to go into academia. Like I was such an ambitious student. I loved school. I I actually applied to MIT, but then I pulled out because I was like, no, I don't want to do it. Um, but now I realize it's really good that I didn't because I'm too much of a spaz. Too much of a spaz. Now yeah. I'm, I'm distracted. I'm thinking. There must be papers about <laughs> when you have two bubbles. Yeah, you would need to know the physics of two bubbles. When, when you have two bubbles colliding, one will pop first. And there has to be good models of that. But that's very, that has to do with chemistry and whatever the the material the bubble is made from. But then, no, there's materials in here. There's got, somebody must understand bubble wrap deeply, like deeply. So I'm just going to take a quick restroom break because uh, Lex is on his own train now <laughs> and I'm just going to leave you and to talk about bubble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually don't need to go to the restroom. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I'm going to insert like a two hour uh, instructional here with like a blackboard where I... It's the skill of a podcaster. It's I feel like I could throw you any topic and you could just go on about it. I don't know if I have that skill. I just <laughs> I yeah, love bubble too, wrap. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, bubble and, on bubble <laughs> and, interaction. Go. So you, you did mention um, at MIT, uh, you went to college for physics for one year mm -hmm. and you dropped out. Mm -hmm. What do you learn from that? Who do you think should and shouldn't go to college? Mm. I think, first of all, you shouldn't listen to me. Um, that should be the name of your autobiography. First of all, you shouldn't listen to me. <laughs> I... You know, I realized that I was there for the wrong reasons. I had this deep, I got completely, like, starting to get grades in school, which in Sweden at that time, we started getting it at eighth grade. So when I was 14, it just kind of hijacked my brain because I realized that I could put a number on how smart I was. And I got obsessed with it. And I wanted to study mechanical engineering because I was like, I like machines. But then physics was kind of the hardest thing you could do. And I had this like deep need to prove to myself that I was smart. So I started studying physics, realized I wasn't that smart. <laughs> I realized, or I mean, just mostly that I like, I love math, but I don't love math 10 hours a day. Yeah. And also, I think I am a generalist through and through. Like, I'm 
decent at a fair amount of things, but definitely not a specialist in any ways. And this, it was such a specialist type of area um, that I felt like the other parts of my brain kind of just dwindled and died. So I think I think most of all, if people are thinking about going to college, and especially if you're here in the States and it's so fucking expensive, really, okay, there's two, there's two things I want to do. One is like, actually go to a workplace where people are doing the job Mm -hmm. that you think you want to do if you want to become a doctor like be at a hospital and like try to see how doctors work and if you actually like it because I feel like people have a lot of ideas of what it's going to be like and it just doesn't match with reality and then I think when people figure out what they want to do there's kind of that's two separate questions or there's two questions that you could split out of that one is like what do you actually want to do that for me for the last 10 years is building stuff. But then there's a second part to that question, which is what context do you want to do that? Mm -hmm. Do you want to build stuff at a startup or at a big corporation? Do you want to build stuff for an art gallery or for the movies or for YouTube? And I think that's often like people only learn how to answer the first question, but then it's like the context means as much because I was building stuff at Punch Through Design and I wasn't getting that like deep fulfillment. Like I felt like I wasn't fully using myself and like hitting all of my gears because I just wasn't that motivated about building stuff for other people. And I changed the context and everything changed. And so sometimes you do need to consider resume and stuff like that for mm-hmm. depending on the, but some I think people consider that way too much, especially in modern times. I feel like, you don't need to go to college just for the resume. I feel like the biggest benefit of college, I mean, there's a bunch, but one is just to do hard things. Mm -hmm. But you could do hard things anywhere. But um, some people need to be, I was probably one of those people, to be forced to do hard things. (laughs) And um, the other is to meet fascinating humans from all walks of life that are pursuing, that have all kinds of different passions. And it allows you to learn Depending on the major, you can beco- you can learn generally, and you can search if you're doing it efficiently about what actually inspires you. Um, and the other thing is the the resume thing. Yeah. But ultimately, you don't need college to find your passion to run with it. I mean, I have so much college FOMO though. Like, yeah. I think it's I chose a different set of experiences. And when I applied to MIT, I was, I think I was 24, because I was like, oh, maybe I should become an electrical engineer because I really liked electronics. Um, But then I remember seeing that the average age was 18 and I was like, oh, fuck, no, I can't hang out. Or like be in a room filled with 18 year olds who are smarter than me. Yeah. Um, So I think I definitely like missed the train on having that experience. But at the same time, I did so many other things and I chose other experiences and I wouldn't trade them. But I still like, I mean, I'll go to on a campus and I'll be like, oh. Yeah. But I think it's also because I have a dreamy idea of what it is because I never had to do it and practice fully. Exactly. It's the FOMO. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. A lot of people really struggle with that burden. They'll... They'll go, it doesn't matter how long you go through, if you don't go all the way to the PhD, you, a lot of people have the FOMO. It doesn't, it's a silly, silly, silly little notion, I think. Cause I think you should be doing college or school until you find something that lights your heart aflame. Where you're like, fuck yes, I wanna do this. Yeah. And run with it. I mean, you can, you can find that in other contexts as well. I've I found it. Yeah, but exactly. yeah, but it is a I mean, buffet of experiences that you can have. What about what was the most fun robot to make or um, musical artistic creation where the process was the most fun? Oh, so, they're all painful in different ways. So pain. Yeah. Do you pain. find pain fun? No, but it's it definitely the pride of make getting to pull something off or like managing to pull something off even when it was really difficult is is very satisfying. What was the difficult thing that you pulled off? You were like, yeah, Mm. this is cool. I like working on jigsaw puzzles, but I don't like how much table space they take up Mm -hmm. because I like just have one big table where I can do it. And that's also my dining table. 
So I made this mechanical table where you can switch between two tabletops. Mm -hmm. And that was an incredibly painful project. And I'm really happy with the outcome and like so proud that I managed to pull it off. How does it switch tabletops? It's a tambour mechanism. So like tambour, like you'll have on like old record player, um, like it's these like thin slats of wood with fabric on the back and you can kind of get them to go around curves. So basically one of the table tops or table surfaces is tambour and then there's a little crank and you can kind of roll it off to the side and it reveals another tabletop under it that you can then lift up because it's on cams um so you can switch between the two i think that one was both really difficult to pull off and it's also one of few projects that i use in my everyday life like i use it almost every day you know what a really cool one was that uh that was part of your ted talk where there's a rotating thing that you wear on your shoulders. <laughs> was that hard to make? So for, um, for people who haven't seen your TED Talk, they should, of course. But it's, uh, oh, how would you describe it? Oh, they cut out the that? best joke. You put, how would you call that device? Sorry, I, the, I don't even know. I never used it beyond the TED Talk, really. Um, yeah, yeah, but basically it's the shoulder rig, and it has this like almost like Saturn ring-looking platform that goes around. I can't even remember what the you, problem proposition was that I was trying to solve. Variety, probably. Introduce some variety yeah. to your life. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And, this, and an element of surprise, because you can put popcorn, as you did on it, uh -huh. and it goes around as a little hand. Why is it like a tiny hand funny? I don't know, but it just slams whatever is on oh, that and thing into your, your face. Mouth. Yeah. I don't know. Was that easy to make? Yeah. That one's fine. I can't. There was, I mean, my TED Talk was so... Yeah, for one, once again, they cut out my best joke. What was the best joke? My best joke, and they didn't even ask me about it. It was, um, so there's this whole lead up where I built a chopping machine. So it's a machine that chops vegetables and it has yep. two giant knives and it goes dunk, dunk, yep. dunk, dunk, and it's, it's kind of one. terrifying. And I show a video of it and then it ends on this gif of it chopping up a banana and I'm kind of scrunching up my face being like, ugh, ugh. Yeah. And the whole reason I show that project is because I'm leading it up to the punchline of, oh, and as a bonus, this gif right here is the perfect response if anyone ever sends you dick pics you don't want, which brought down the house. It does it every time. And they cut it out without asking me because they were like, oh, but we wanted people to be able to show it in classrooms. And I was like, I have abandoned the hope of being shown in classrooms for years ago. I think that's a good joke. Thank you. That's a really, you. That's a really good one. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're okay going sometimes a little bit edgy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I say that I'm, I'm crude and wholesome mm -hmm. because I can be very crude, but I also try really, really hard to be a good person. Yeah. And to like, I'll say shit and fucking all that stuff, which I don't even think is crude. Um, but yeah, but I really, really try to wield the power that I have in a thoughtful way. So no, I, I, I wouldn't call me edgy because I'm not, I don't think it's edgy. It's all like chopping a banana with knives and saying it's a good gift response to anyone that sends you dick pics is definitely not edgy. You're correct. Yeah. Uh, I it's, pretty, it's just a funny <laughs> joke. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. funny. I feel bad that Ted cut that. I, I mean, it's fine. It's like, it's a decision that I made really early on where I was like, what I'm, I think often people misinterpret what I'm doing as being for children, which I think is part because like my projects were always really color, colorful and fun. But I think it also has some sprinkles of sexism of being like, oh, it's a woman doing something. She must be doing it for the children. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Fuck the children, I'm doing it for myself. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> so I think I, I was just really early on decided of like, oh, no, I'm not going to try to cater to that. Which like still, I mean, I get a lot of messages from parents being like, can you please stop cussing in your videos? And I'm also like, I get it. But also that is not what's going to mess up your kids. Like, yeah. I really try to yeah. be thoughtful and a decent enough role model. But I'll also acknowledge that humans fuck. Yeah. It's okay. Somehow that you being able to say the F you to the system. <laughs> what word? Word? F <laughs> what? I, do, it. do it. I can't. I can't. I'm scared. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it sounds better when you say F you. It's, 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 it's a dance. I should. Oh, boy. Um, 
Have you ever made a robot that dances with you? No. Okay. You need a dance partner. <laughs> so, is I get this a lonely personal sometimes. Request? Yeah, I, I feel uh, like that's the theme of this whole <laughs> podcast. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most embarrassed you've ever been on your podcast? So I, I don't know if you've experienced this, but I generally embarrassed by most things I say inside my head. Yeah. So like when I say something, like now it's, it's just there's a voice inside my head that goes, <sighs> yeah, <laughs> like what? <laughs> You're a disappointment. Um, like that the parent petting in, in the back, the, the the hand stops working. Yeah, just slows down. Um, And then there's an awkward silence. You don't know what to say next. That's really embarrassing, usually. Um, and also, I used to work as a journalist, so I know how to sit with the silence and try to drag it out of you. See what I did there? <laughs> you gave up. You, you pulled out. I quit. <laughs> you I was sweating. I, I was went. literally sweating. Okay. Uh, yeah, also, because you're in a full fucking suit. What is yeah. that? Like, how did that come about? Actually, it was probably MIT is because everybody was dressing in like sweatpants, the very chill wear. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I like taking everything seriously. Mm -hmm. It just felt like a, it was my way of saying F you to the way things are. Because I like, I always admire Richard Feynman. I like it, how there's like a classiness to it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's for visual purposes, but it's just how I feel when I put on a suit. It makes it makes me feel like I'm gonna take this really, really seriously. Yeah. And if I embarrass myself, it's all my fault. Because I tried, there's no excuse. I tried 100%. The interesting thing about your TED Talk, to go to a dark topic. Mm. <laughs> This is what happened when I walked off stage. No, what happened when you walked off stage? Found out that I had a brain tumor. Was that not where you're going? There's yes. something else dark about my, yeah. Well, yes. Uh, I thought you knew through the TED Talk. You found out right after. I mean, the reason that I found out was partly because of the TED Talk, because my mom came into town to be there for it. And my right eyelid was swollen, and it had kind of been swelling over a while. And I'd even gotten comments about it on my YouTube channel. And I thought it was allergies because I was like, oh, it's just pollen allergies. It's just affecting my one eye because maybe I sleep mostly on that side. I don't know. And my mom came into um, the States and then Vancouver for my TED Talk. And she's like, Simone, you have to like have a scan or see what's up. Well, like we have to go to the doctor. And she really pushed me to do it because I was like, fine, fine. Um, and I had an MRI scan on like 5 p.m. on a Friday night. My boyfriend at the time was there. And I remember like halfway through an MRI scan, they kind of pull you out and they put inject contrast fluid or this like thing that, yeah, just gives them another type of scan. And the nurse looked at me in this way and was like, how long have you had symptoms for? Mm -hmm. And that's when I knew that they'd found something and then they like shove you back into the machine for another 20 minutes. And my ex was just seeing like them like zooming in and out of my scans. And there was like this obviously something that just looked wrong in there. And they sent me to the ER and I found out that I had a brain tumor the size of a golf ball that probably been grown since I was a teenager. So it'd been growing over like 10, 15 years. And uh, yeah, I had surgery to remove it. And then it kept on growing, the parts that they couldn't remove, and I went through radiation treatment. So that was like two years that just was kind of dedicated to just getting better and getting back to where I am now. And I remember, like, I was so stoked about 2020 because I was like, this is the first year that I'm not held back by my health, and I'm like, finally going to be able to do everything I'm feathered. And then the pandemic happens, and you're kind of just like, okay, just in the backseat of what's happening and things that are out of my control again. In your public, you made a couple of videos about yeah. uh, about it. I have a brain tumor. My brain tumor is back. Mm -hmm. You kind of, you know, you name your tumor Brian. Mm -hmm. You kind of make it a lighthearted thing. 
but so you don't reveal much of the darkness. But were you scared? <clears throat> or some low yeah. points? Of course I was. Of course I was scared. I mean, it, it's terrifying. It's like, and also when it's in your brain, like, you know, I was like, take any other part of me, but don't take my brain. Um, no, it's this unfathomable thing that happens and you're like, I'm healthy. I've had, how could this possibly be a brain tumor? Like my eye is swollen. Like there's nothing there. I haven't had any seizures. I haven't had any cognitive issues. I haven't had any headaches even. Like how is that even possible? Um, so you go through a lot of different stages of just trying to understand what it is. And I think I remember being hit like right as I found out when we were in like an Uber, poor Uber driver from where I had my MRI scan to the ER where they sent me. And I was really both really grateful that I've gotten so much more out of life than I ever thought I would. Like I've had a hell of a life. And even if it would have ended really early, I would have done so much more than I ever thought. But I was also really, really sad that I hadn't had kids yet. Like that was my big grief of like, fuck, I haven't had, had have time to have kids yet. Um, but no, it's terrifying. I mean, the prospect of somebody cutting up your head, like that's terrifying. But it honestly wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. What about the radiation treatment? What What are some things that, you know, people should, well, you learned about it, about the process and about yourself mm -hmm. through that, that, that people might be interested about? I think surgery was both harder and easier than radiation treatment because it was, it was harder because it was so much more intense and it's such a dramatic thing, like going to the hospital that morning and being like, I don't know, and you feel so awful when you wake up. and But then the recovery from it was pretty linear. Like almost every week I would get a little bit better. The thing about radiation is that it was not linear at all. And it kind of drained me in this weird, like it was so hard to predict. And also they put me on these, um, I spent months feeling like I was high out of my mind. And I couldn't process reality in a way that I normally would. Like, everything just felt off. Like, I felt, yeah, I felt like I was high on drugs. And I kept on asking my doctors what was going on. And they're like, no, I don't know. I don't think it's anything related. And I was on this Alzheimer's medicine that they put you on to prevent dementia from radiation treatment. Like, kind of as a preventative. And I found all these subreddits of people using that Alzheimer's medicine to get high. <laughs> and people be like, oh my God, bro, I took like 20 milligrams yesterday and I was high out of my mind. And I'm like, I'm on 30 milligrams a day. <laughs> like, of course it feels weird. And that was honestly one of the scariest parts of it because that was the first time where I felt like it genuinely affected my way of processing reality. And yeah, I was so relieved when I found out that that was what was causing it because I felt like I was going crazy. But even after surgery, like, I woke up and I felt like myself. Like, everything was – I got no brain injury. So, obviously, this is, like, my experience from somebody who came out of it pretty unscathed, who didn't get any brain injuries and didn't have to do any of that recovery. It's more just the recovery from, like, the physical act of somebody cutting your skull open and taking a large chunk out. Did you research all the things that can go wrong no. during surgery? No. I honestly am I'm a bit surprised by how I acted. Just pausing for you to pour. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, editors. <laughs> this I, is like a commercial. <laughs> this is like work injury from being a YouTuber. <laughs> it's all like freeze if there's audio that comes in. <sighs> Ah, uh, yeah, sponsored by <laughs> tap water. Um, I was surprised by how little I was willing to think critically about what my doctors told me to do. Like I very early on, I, I the neurologist that I worked with, he was the one who was on call at the ER the day where I came in. 
And he was the one who ended up doing my surgery. And he kind of became like my rock in this. And I just 100% trusted him. And he turned out to be an amazing doctor and like did a great job and was just like, an, so I got so, so lucky. But I remember my mom being like, oh, but we should like talk about second opinions and like we should try to do more research. And I was like so unwilling to do that because opening up to the idea that there are multiple ways or multiple things that might be right or wrong was so terrifying. Like I wanted there to just be like, no, this is the only option. This is what we need to do. And if I started questioning that, then I don't know if I would have been able to go through with it. So yeah, it was a strange, I just really wanted to trust the doctors that I worked with. And I was very scared to question them in any way. How did that process change your relationship with death? Are you afraid of death? Not, Do you ponder your mortality? Yeah, I think it took away a part of youth for me. Like the innocence? Yeah. I mean, you kind of think of terrible things as something that happens to other people and death and illness. Um, so I think it kind of fast-tracked that for me. But... It mostly changed my relationship to life. It changed, it's made me so much more gentle with myself. Like going through illness, it forces you to redefine what it means to be good. And before being good had been pushing myself really hard. It had been working and I don't know, just just being really hard with myself and disciplined. And when you're healing from something, being good is listening to your body. It's resting. It's like really being in tune with what your health, where your health is at. And I think that is something that's kind of stuck with me since then. I'm like so much more gentle and delicate with myself. And with others? Or you, ah, you, fuck. You. Yeah. <laughs> I think it definitely, it's like, when you're young and healthy, it's really hard to <laughs> yeah. um, know what it feels like to be ill. Yeah. And I remember, you know, you like go to yoga class and you'd be like, oh my God, this is too slow. Like I want it to be, I have so much more energy. Like yeah. I need to. And when I was recovering from my brain surgery, there was this yoga studio nearby my house and they had uh, yoga for seniors. And I was so stoked because I was like, oh, this is a yoga class I'll be able to take. Yeah. And I think that was really eye-opening of just like, there's no, you kind of imagine that it's just like, oh, just push yourself harder. But no, that's not it with age or sickness or it's just, you got to be so gentle with yourself and you have to cater to people where they're at. Yeah, and just the uh, appreciation of this like biological ve vehicle you get and you should take care of it. Being sick sucks. Yeah. It's awful. And I really, I'm really motivated to postpone that for as much as I can. And also I was so tremendously grateful when I got ill that I felt like I had so much to take from. Like I had so many energy reservoirs. I'd spent my life taking pretty decent care of my body and like exercising and eating well and like not wrecking my body in any way. And I felt like this was the first time where that was so critical and I felt like my body was ready for it, you know? I thought you were gonna go the other way, like um you can you can take care of your body all you want and it's um bad stuff happens, so you should you should go on drug binges and go wild <laughs> and do crazy things and I mean I also had that that thought where I was like, I fucking floss every day. How do I have a brain tumor? <laughs> I've been good. Like why does this happen to me? But more so it was like my body was so resilient and ready for it. And um I was I was really, really proud of it yeah, it's amazing that the human body is able to recover from even the harshest things yeah it's it's wild and my brain so after after surgery because yeah i had a brain tumor the size of a golf ball kind of behind my right eye and after brain surgery you kind of just have this big hole in your head like this void and usually your brain stays that way like it retains the shape even after the brain tumor is gone but 
for some reason, my brain was feeling really ambitious and it has completely flopped back. And I have almost like a normal looking brain now mm. where doctors are like, oh, we would almost not be able to tell that you had one. Um, so yeah, that just blew my mind. Be like, when did it, was that why I had all those headaches yeah, after surgery? <laughs> <laughs> it's just my brain being like, ah! Try <laughs> working. Yeah. yeah. Oh, pretty cool thing I wanted to ask you about is the uh, everyday calendar that you worked on. Mm -hmm. That was a long time. That took a long time. Yeah. So basically, I, I designed this calendar. Like, I wanted to start meditating every day. Mm -hmm. But it's really hard to meditate every day and to, like, kind of build that habit. And what I would do is I would make these grids in my notebooks where I could, like, check a box for every day. Like, I just wanted, like, a little ding. I did it. And, like, this thing of accountability but then I was like, this is, I don't want to have a notebook that I do this in. Like, I want an art piece that I can hang on my wall, like accountability art. And I made uh, this thing called the Everyday Calendar, which has an entire year on it. So it's 365 days. And if you tap any of the days, you light it up. Mm -hmm. And we turn it into a Kickstarter campaign. And it's now a product that I'm selling in my through my product business, the Yatch Store. What's it called? The Yatch Store. Yeah. And uh, that, for people who are confused, is the right way to pronounce your last name. Which does it? It's right, but it's so wrong. It makes my last name is spelled G I E R T Z. Who's, who does that song? Uh, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. Yeah, I'm, uh, it's pronouncing what, my last name. Yeah, that's what that's what makes me think. Because uh, what's his name? Uh, the, uh, the the from the Office. He covers it. Um, from the British office, which is the better office. <sighs> okay, uh, tangent upon a tangent upon a tangent. So you said you created the everyday calendar mm -hmm. to make a more beautiful, in quotes, and more sacred gold star system on a wall, mm -hmm. not a notebook that gets thrown into a drawer. Yeah, wow, well said past me. <laughs> you uh, you said that making this calendar taught you a lot, in quotes. I feel like a, like a real investigative journalist. <laughs> uh, can, can, <laughs> You've said in 2018. No. Yeah, I'm waiting for can, the gotcha. Can you share some of the lessons you've learned? Like, what, what do you mean you've you've learned a lot from making this calendar? Uh -oh. like, what are we talking about? As somebody who builds things, manufacturing something is such an unrelated process. Like, making one of something and making 10,000 of something. Like, they're not even distant cousins. Like, it's completely different beasts to tackle. And... um yeah, so that was one of it. Everything takes so much longer than you think it's going to. I did a Kickstarter campaign that we launched in 2018 after my surgery. And yeah, it's just, you know, you think you're so generous with the timelines. We still ended up being a year late, but we shipped. We're, we're good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm trying to get my product business off the ground. We launched in May. And it's just, yeah, it's just a pain. As somebody who's terrified of disappointing people, I'm like, why <laughs> have I chosen some of the jobs where it's the easiest to disappoint people? You can disappoint people at scale now. Yeah, I can disappoint people at scale and also them actually haven't paid me money yeah. to deliver on something, which is a terrible transaction. But it's, I'm just stoked to realize that I love the job still. Like, I love the product development aspect of it. I love trying to design stuff for manufacturing and figure it out and, like, anticipate how people are going to use your products. And, like, the everyday calendar, I mean, we've sold thousands of them now. They're all over the world. And it's, like, people actually finding something useful that I made and implementing them into their lives. It's just mind-boggling. Especially because this is tracking habits. Good habits. So or bad is... ones. You can do it wherever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can use it however you want. I went in a drinking binge again today. Yeah. Success. Great Kicked success. Kicked another kid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what does it take to uh, mass manufacture something? What did you learn about that? Like, what, what are, can, can you like uh, elucidate the gap between the one, the prototype versus the, the like product development for mass manufacture. I mean, for one of it is like, yeah, the manufacturing, the tooling that they use in manufacturing and to do things in a cost-effective way is really different. Like I can make a one-off, then it's going to take me 17 hours. But obviously you can't spend 17 hours per calendar when you're doing something in factory. Um, 
I think it's that like quality control is such a beast. You cannot trust anybody telling you that things are going to be okay. Like you're, you have to have such trust issues. And it's also terrifying. I mean, as somebody who's doing everything independently, I haven't raised any capital for it. Like it's all self-invested and we're doing it all in-house. It's just, you know, yeah, I could buy 10,000 calendars, but then what if all of them are have a manufacturing issue? Or, you know, it's just... It's just terrifying because the risks are so high. But also, I got to this point where, for one, this is something that I wanted to do for a long time. But something that going through health problems taught me is how fragile my business model is. Because, I mean, I'm basically running an influencer business where I make videos on YouTube and then I have an ad spot and I talk about a brand. So, like, I'm a human billboard, um, which is fine. It grants me a lot of freedom to play around. Um, But if I am not well enough to be on a stage giving talks or be in front of a camera, everything stops. Like it's such a pillar of a business and it can topple over at any given moment. Or like YouTube could change the algorithm, like legislation could catch up and change how you're able to advertise on the internet. Like it's so frail and I really felt like I need to diversify what I'm doing and also just to keep it interesting for myself. So what I decided was to start a product business because also it's kind of this perfect combination of businesses where I can turn my YouTube channel into an R&D department because I have a reason to constantly be exploring things and churning out new products. I can also do that as early audience testing and see what people are actually excited about. And if there's something that I think would make an interesting product, I can pass that over to the product business. And then once I'm ready to market that and sell it, I can pass it over to the YouTube channel. So it's like I can kind of once I realized that YouTube didn't feel like an end goal for me, I was like, okay, then I can use it as a tool to accomplish these other things that I want to do. And this was one of them. So yeah, it's a lot that went into it. And one of the tools, like you said, is R and D, but it's also kind of advertisement for the mm-hmm. cool stuff that you're doing. I think, I think Mr. Beast is one of the creators that's also starting to understand this power mm-hmm. of this uh, reputation that you've built, of like people trust you, like they love you to do cool stuff. They trust that you put your heart and soul into a thing. Yeah. So like, and they feel your pain and the struggle too, you know? Like if a product, like for example, say the everyday calendar, like there was issues in manufacturing something like this. Which they would, we've had, yeah. <laughs> they would feel the pain of that and they would still support it. I mean, that, that's yeah. the beauty of it when you have the actual person right there struggling with their with their lows and highs. That's a decision that I made really early on where I was like, the Yet store is supported by me, but it's separate from me. It's not merchandise. You don't have to know who I am or care about who I am to be interested in this product. And if you go on the website, yetch.store, mm, plug. Uh, it's like, it's if I'm on Y-E-T-C-H. the about page, <laughs> y-e-t-c-h.store, uh, like, you have to go to the about page to find anything about me. Like, it's definitely not like this is Simone's brand. And I think anybody who's followed me for a long time will see that, like, my personality is sprinkled into it, but it's still, like, clean off of me. And I think that's also because I wanted something that was separate from me because I am also running out of narcissism, believe it or not. I'm <laughs> Like, I don't uh, yeah. feel like I want to – I don't want it to be about me. And I want it to be something that can also run independently of me and doesn't, like, I, I want to be able to retire my face and still do, like, the other stuff because I think it's fun, but I don't want that to be the core of it. What other kind of stuff uh, have you worked on for the product design of uh, for, for Yetch? So, I mean, a lot of the products, I decided to launch the store with a really small roster of products because developing products is such a it's it's such upfront heavy like cost wise and mm-hmm. just investment it's such a it's very big upfront investment so and I know that it would take a while or I knew it would take a while for me to kind of find the right tonality and visual language for the brand so I just wanted to launch it have it be out there start working on it start like learning more about what it entails uh, even if we just had a small roster product so we released it with. We have a puzzle. 
Yes. This is just a whim. Uh, but I wanted to release a puzzle that has one piece missing. Mm-hmm. So it's actually, for, as far as I can tell, it's the world's first officially incomplete puzzle. Mm-hmm. You get 499 out of 500 pieces. I keep the 500th piece. So I have a box in my workshop with everybody's missing pieces. Yeah. And I don't know what to do with it yet, but someday it will come to me. Profound artistic statement. It is something. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely something. And I, I, I'm surprised by how many of them we've sold, which I'm also like, I kind of wanted to have that product out, product out there because I was like, can you imagine having a pitch deck if I do ever raise money of being like, you know how good I am at selling things? I sold people 5,000 incomplete puzzles. Incomplete puzzles. <laughs> yeah. Um, also have, you know, it's like a lot of the products, I call them basket fillers. Like they're kind of just like stuff where I'm like, yeah, this is like easy to throw into your basket. I mean, we have these rings, I'm wearing them. So there's a screwdriver ring, which is a Phillips head screwdriver, and then a screw ring that kind of has a recess, like a Phillips head screw. I have these sawdust socks that make you look like your feet are covered in sawdust, like you spend all time in the, all day in the shop without having to put any of the actual effort in. But then... We have four more products in the pipeline that we're working on and that are kind of the more, the the big ambitious products that are more in line with what I want the brand to be. Like the tagline is unique solutions to everyday problems. And it's just a lot of like trying to develop novel takes on existing products. So something where the function becomes a bigger, bigger part mm-hmm. of the design. Yeah. And so what's the process of creating something like that? Like the even the everyday calendar. So, like, what what are some challenges that are interesting along the way? So, you have to sketch it out. You have to like brainstorm, draw things out, and then create a schematic and see like how mm-hmm. how do you know what it's going to look like visually? Don't. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I so the everyday calendar, the first. So, I just built it for myself first. Like that did not come as a as a product idea first. Um, And that's kind of been the process that I've had for a lot of things. Like I make it for myself and then I'm like, oh, maybe other people would find this useful too. So the everyday calendar, the first prototype I made, it had actually physical mechanical toggle switches. So 365 toggle switches that you could flip. So if you worked out that day or meditated, for me it was meditating, um, you could just flip that switch. And that was great. But when I started evaluating it as a product, it's if you have 365 of something in a product, like the runaway cost is crazy. So the cheapest option, most reliable option we could find was capacitive touch. So basically it's a touch interface and the front plate is a circuit board itself. So it's this like circuit board um, that's designed in this really fancy way. So it looks like a a beautiful piece of art, not to toot my own horn too much, uh, <laughs> but it's actually a circuit board, um, which I also thought was really interesting of like using this that people usually hide away in, in in products. And it felt like a nod to my career in electronics as well, being like, no, let's make it pretty and let's make it put it front and forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, what I'm realizing now more and more is like, there's so many of like, I would love to turn the puzzle table into a product. But then it's like, that would be a $7,000 table. And I don't want to sell a table for $7,000. So you're kind of limited to the price bracket you're in. And it's like, your margins are tough. Like maintaining your margins are really, really tough. And as somebody who's like, I would love to sell the stuff that we're doing cheaper, but you just, it's just not feasible. Like you need those margins to survive. And well, one of the, the genius things in the conversations I've had with Elon is the ability through sort of systematic, questioning of how things have been done in the past to discuss what is the lowest cost way to solve a problem. And so he's very good at getting to, like with Optimus Robot, for example, the humanoid robot, how do you get the cost down? Yeah. And that seems to be like one of the essential things to do in um, in any product that you have to mass manufacture is constantly discuss like, how do we simplify, simplify? It's definitely a design limitation that's interesting. It's both hard and interesting to work within. And that's such a different thing as well. It's like, I mean, as I talked about before, like what is the context in which you're creating things? Like I'm still building things, I'm still inventing things, but I changed the context and it has a very different set of limitations. And constantly trying to simplify your product to make it cheaper. And yeah, it's a really interesting and different type of, design process. You can lose some of the magic though, right? Like 
people can do that a little bit too much. I think Apple is famous, like Johnny Ive is famous for sort of focusing on the design first and not worrying about the cost later because you don't want to sacrifice. There's some stuff that's going to cost more, but it keeps yeah. some of the magic. I think it's for some of the products that we're working on, it's like, I'm like, let's just make it the best we think it can be. And then we can scale back from there. Like, just, just like, let's not impose these limitations on ourselves up front. Like, let's just make it the most beautiful version of itself. And then we can decide what we want to compromise with mm-hmm. or compromise on. Yeah. That's what I say every, every day when I look in the mirror. Yeah, just make the most beautiful. beautiful. And then we can compromise. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just <laughs> discuss so you put how on it goes that wrong. suit. Yeah. Yeah. And then see how shit goes wrong later. All right. All right. Uh, I'll back a little bit to the robots. Just, um, or actually to one of your more epic projects. I mean, they're all epic, but Truckla. Yeah. You cutting into a Tesla and turning into an epic truck. What was that like? Where did the idea come from? The idea came from that I really wanted an electric pickup truck. Yeah. Like I've only really driven electric because I got my driver's license pretty late. And I'm like one of that first generation of drivers. It's like probably never going to have a gas vehicle. Um, but yeah, this was in 2018 as well. 2018 was a big year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or 2019. I can't remember. And I figured that we could just make our own. So you took a Tesla? Tesla Model 3. Model 3? Mm-hmm. And you cut off a mm-hmm. piece of it. Mm-hmm. And you turn it into a pickup truck. What's the... Um... <laughs> uh, it looks pretty badass. So like, what, what are some of the challenges of doing that? It's unlike other projects you've done. Yeah. It's, it's very much outside of my realm. Like, I'm not a, a car person. I haven't worked on cars before. So we brought in a big team. Um and had another project manager for it and stuff. Because also, like, cars, you definitely don't want things to go wrong. Like, there's no part of me that wants to fuck around and make something that's going to be really unsafe for me or for other people who are driving with me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was about a year of planning. And then we got the car. And then we spent a month just tearing it apart and trying to make it. I, I was so set. Like, I really wanted the car just for its function. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm so fine with it if it's really ugly. Mm-hmm. But then we managed to make it actually look really good. Oh, so that that wasn't part of the discussion, like how the final thing looks. I was I wasn't so I wasn't that fussed about it. I was like, I just want it to. I just want it for its function. Like I really want this car. I don't want it because it looks cool. But then it ended up looking pretty cool as well. And I'm really. I mean, even now, a couple of years later, when there are some more options of electric pickup trucks, I still stand Truckla. Like, she's, <laughs> like, Rivian, Ford F-150, like, they're all great, but they're giant. You're sitting there on a porch in your, in your cowboy hat. Yeah. Drinking whiskey and saying. With my cattle dog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just a shotgun a small, I wanted like a small 90s pickup truck. Back to shitty robots. You reuse parts of previous robots a lot. What's like a memorable example of that? It's just the graveyard of parts. I mean, workshop. I've gotten better at keeping projects intact. In the beginning, I used to disassemble every project because I was also a much a much more stringent budget. So if I needed a motor, then I would like steal it off of an existing robot or a previous robot. But I've gotten really good at not doing that now because I'm like, maybe one day I want to have a museum exhibit and then it would be nice to have all of those machines intact and not having to rebuild them. Centuries from now, the you know you can look at Benjamin Franklin's house. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, no, we're just you gonna look, look at my some, house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just house, just, <laughs> no, but... just some weird shit. Uh, yeah, that goes great with my idea of myself. <laughs> with the autobiography, yeah, yeah. You said that people keep requesting in the comments. They did I put a dildo on it? Yep, yeah, they have. I have. Wait, my... was that actually what you were gonna ask? Yeah, I have dildo written in my notes. I thought I just made it into a raunchy punchline. We you were actually going to get there. Yeah, that was in the early days, in the shitty robot days. But now I have a filter on my YouTube channel for every possible spelling dildo. of dildo. So, I mean, 
people want to probably sexualize robots, right? And then, or or they put they weapons. want to sexualize my relationship with them. Yeah. Oh. You know, because I have majority male followers, and they're so sweet and so res- like respectful, ninety nine percent. But I realize like it, there is a lot of. I realize that society hasn't taught men how to have female role models. And the way that people channel it is through being like, oh, it's because I want to fuck her or I want to date her or I want to marry her. And I'm like, I don't think you want any of those things. I think you actually just admire my work. Mm -hmm. But you don't know how to look up to a woman. Yeah. That's beautifully put. Uh, What about weapons? Do you get requests to put weapons on a thing? It's interesting. I kind of started in robotics as just like a happy camper who is really into like tinkering. And now I'm kind of seeing some of the darker parts of it. And I remember first time I went to a proper factory and I saw like big industrial robot arms at work. And I was like, oh, wow, this is what it is about, you know? And it was almost scary where I was like, oh, I've just been like playing around with these tiny versions of this. And I'm like, oh my God, everybody, robotics is cool and fun. And then you get in there and you're like, this is kind of terrifying. You were platforming the very things that will destroy human civilization. (laughs) You're making it fun and entertaining. I'm the mouthpiece and I'm (laughs) like getting people into robotics and engineering and we're all just building our demise and accelerating speed. No, but I mean, I had that in like the same with also with like, Companies who are saying that they're never going to put weapons on their robots and then have military contracts and stuff like that. You're like, this is dark and scary. Fortunately, I haven't gotten a lot of requests for it. Yeah, drones are are terrifying, especially. They're fucking terrifying. And it's really everything. I mean, we humans are so good at creative ways of killing and fucking each other. It's like almost how everything goes. Yeah, it's it's like, the... and it's yeah. I I'm I'm terrified of the future where we are going to use more robots to kill each other, and come up with new and new creative ways to kill and hurt each other. Yeah, emotionally, psychologically, physically. Yeah. Speaking of which, what are your thoughts about? I don't know if you've been paying attention, but ChatGPT, the advancement in our in language models and artificial intelligence. Have you added speaking capabilities? To any of your devices? I have have Siri on, yeah. I used to have an Amazon Echo in my house, but then I removed it. Uh, It just freaked me out that I could whisper from my bed and it heard me. I'd be like, Alexa, play Spotify. I'd be like, playing Spotify. Yeah. Fuck. (laughs) Uh, I, I think it is a powerful tool that we are not fully ready for. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I think um, the internet is kind of a parade of us using powerful things in harmful ways. And I think chatbots are really, really exciting. I'm stoked to have a personal assistant that's like or a virtual assistant that actually does a good job and can solve problems for me. But yeah, it also feels like it can get dark really, really quickly. Yeah, because uh, you can form close connections like we're talking about with it, and then it can be used to manipulate you. Mm-hmm. Uh, manipulate you in terms of what is true and manipulate you in terms of getting you to buy stuff. Yeah. Or um, maybe because, at least for now, it's centralized, getting everybody to think the same way. I mean, for, I mean, it's the same in, like, algorithms being used to radicalize people or kind of having that as a consequence of the way that they work and combine that with a really advanced language model. And like you can control people's worldview in a way that you could, I mean, it's just, it's it's wild. And I think we're not ready for it. And I don't know if we ever would be because we're very impressionable, little squishy flesh bags. Which- takes us back to the when the squishy flesh flesh bags interact which one pops first still i'm going oh, yeah. to into this the bubble wrap. bubble on bubble new paper paper coming out of my Lex Friedman. <laughs> what were we talking about oh um what about consciousness so you never anthropomorphize the robots did they ever come to life for you where you kind of thought 
No, because they built them and I know how they work. So that prevents you from being able to see the magic. I don't know, yeah. But I think it's like, I definitely, when I did a lot of the shitty robot stuff, like I wanted them to move like a, a human or like in a more organic way and not just like point A to point B, yeah. which is the easiest way to program stuff. Um, so still. I wanted other people to anthropomorphize them, yeah. but I don't think I, I did necessarily. I, I'm trying to think of a piece of technology that I've kind of projected feelings upon, but no, I can't. So s sometimes what makes me anthropomorphize something, even though I built it, is uh, there's a uh, element of surprise. So especially with machine learning, you're surprised by the kind of things it does. Mm -hmm. have, have you ever been surprised by a robot? No, because they're all pretty dumb. Like also dumb. the robots I built, it's like, they're all just servos moving from, I mean, they're, I don't think I've built anything with a huge amount of sensors or like they're just moving in a pattern that I program them to move. What's the most complex thing you've built? I mean, probably Trucla. Trucla. Yeah, was complex just for the sheer scale of it. And like the, I mean, both. I think that was my biggest project, both in terms of build scope, but also in terms of impact that it had. Like that project just went wild. But then, yeah, then I don't know. <laughs> the bubble wrap music box, I don't fucking know. They're all complicated yeah, in different ways. That, yeah. that one is epic. How does uh, the bubble wrap connect to the flute, by the way? What's, how does that work? The flute is just right where, like, where mounted right where it pops it. Okay. Yeah. That's so fascinating. I gotta watch that video. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fun. Funny enough, uh, in my in deep investigative journalistic <laughs> research of you, yeah, it says you're you used to be an MMA reporter. Yeah. <laughs> how 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 did it, how did that happen? How did you get into it? I was really into martial arts. I was like a huge UFC buff. I mean, this is 2010, maybe. You practice martial arts yourself? I did. Yeah, I was mostly stand up. I did really. Like, um, I did a lot of Muay Thai and then some Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and just yeah. I was really. The thing is, I I get really intense about my hobbies, <laughs> and I was so all into in. it. I was yeah. all in. Awesome. And um. I had worked a little bit as a journalist and I was like, oh, I should like do MMA reporting. And I emailed uh, this uh, MMA website in Sweden. I was like, hey, can I come and write for you? And they were like, oh, actually we're going to an event in Gothenburg tomorrow. Do you want to come? Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is a lot. It's like 11 p.m. at night, but sure, I'll come. And I went there to their office. I'd never really met them. And I'm like, this is kind of scary. Like I'm a 20 year old girl. And going there in a group of men, with a group of men, and um, they were so rude. Mm -hmm. They like I, I went there and I was like, "Hey, what's up?" And they were all kind of ignoring me and just like not looking at me or interacting with me until they realized that Simon was a girl because mm -hmm. we'd only talked over email. And they're like, "Oh, this guy named Simon is gonna come," <laughs> and then they were like, "Oh fuck, Simon! It's actually Simone, yeah, and it's a girl." Uh, so I kind of like slid into that in a very, very strange way. And I did that for a year, but then I got kicked out of an interview with Alexander Gustafsson. And oh, your I was pronunciation like, is so good. Yeah. <laughs> what you... And then I just kind of never went back and I was done with it. And now I'm not allowed to do martial arts because of brain stuff. So I've, I've kind of put all of that behind me. And it's, it's interesting. It's like, I definitely see the athleticism in it and the skill that goes into it. I think as the older I get, the more concerned I am about the health impacts of the sport and of the people who are practicing it on an elite level. And I'm just not as, um, cannot as 100% um, just cheer as somebody beats somebody else up into a pulp. Yeah, especially considering the effects it might have on the brain. Mm -hmm. May I ask why you got kicked out this is the Gustafson <laughs> yeah. in the interview is anything fun so it's embarrassing it was, what, what no, happened it wasn't I didn't it was not I didn't intend to get kicked out I didn't realize I was going to get kicked out so it was Alexander Gustafson was going to fight John Jones yeah and he had just he was kind of like this golden boy 
in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And he had just come out to the press that he had actually been to jail for violent crimes. And all I wanted to ask, all I asked was, what was the reason that you wanted to bring that forward now? Mm -hmm. And apparently that was completely like blacklisted, but I hadn't gotten briefed about it at all. Yeah. And the um, the PR man, head of PR of the UFC was just yelling at me and they kicked uh -huh. me out of, of Grand, Grand Hotel in Stockholm. And I immediately called my mom and I was like, mom, you will not believe what just happened. I got kicked out of an interview in Grand, at Grand Hotel because in the 90s, she got kicked out of an interview with Mel Gibson from the Grand Hotel. <laughs> so that's like runs in the family. So I was just like, she was proud so, of you? <laughs> yeah, no, it was just this weird that's generational so skip where we both got and kicked out of interviews at the same hotel. You spent uh, quite a bit of time in China as a student. Uh, is that something you could speak to the differences and culturally, maybe even from like a student in an engineering perspective between China and US? Maybe even Sweden. Those are like, technologically speaking, just such fundamentally different places. I mean, I moved to China when I was 16. Yeah. And I went there as an exchange student. So that is before I had ever touched upon those things. And it was, and then I went back when I was 19 to work as an English teacher for a little bit. It was, it was incredibly challenging to be there. The language barrier, the language, the culture. What? All of it. I mean, I was, I was like, you're... now when I look at 16 year olds, I'm like, you're a baby. And I yeah. moved, sorry, 10 to 16 year olds <laughs> listening to this, but like, I just can't believe I did that. And yeah, I didn't speak the language. I got placed in like a small city with almost no foreigners. It was just a constant audience of people staring at you because they haven't interacted with a lot of foreigners before. And yeah, it definitely, and then after that, I moved to Kenya, and I think that was one of the reasons why it was so interesting to move to the States, because people were like, oh, isn't it, like, hard with the language barrier or the cultural difference? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. this is nothing, and I could speak the language, or, like, I could speak English well, and I could kind of pass as an American, even just as I moved here, and it was such a relief where I was like, wow, I'm like an undercover foreigner because I got to a point where I realized like it doesn't matter how good my Mandarin is I'm never people are never gonna fully accept me here so yeah and you moved you uh, went to Kenya you've spoken about this after your parents got divorced yeah when did I talk about that I didn't realize I told that story I know I know so many things. What yeah. do you think this is? Is it from when I have my Amazon Echo installed? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. So <laughs> I made a came few home. Context. I came home from China first time. I was there for a year. It's one of the most turned upside down days of my life. I spent a year there and I was so excited. I had a really rough year. And I was so excited just to come home and like be a child again. I remember thinking and just like feeling like I belonged. And then I came home and I found out that my parents had separated when I was gone and they hadn't told me because they wanted to like not affect my stay there, which I think was 100% the right decision of them to make. But I kind of came home to a house that was starting to get picked apart. And it's a and big shock to your world. It was both yes and no. I think I remember I just sat down on my bed and I was like, well, this isn't what I expected, but I guess I'll move to Kenya because I was one of the few, there were a few Swedish boarding schools in the world. There was one in Brussels, Paris, London, and then one in Nairobi. And I didn't want to miss more school because I'd taken a gap year when I went to China. So I was like, I guess I'll go to Nairobi. And I'm thinking now, like, I, I think if my parents had stayed together, granted, it was amazing that they they did made the right decision in every way. But I, my roots kind of never grew back after that. And I think I just kept on moving abroad and moving around and being really restless. And yeah. And have you ever been able to find a home spiritually? Yeah, I have a home. Yeah. I mean, I have a home in the people around me. And I have, I have a lot of different homes. You know, it's, 
I think what I'm realizing more and more is like you cannot live without consequence and compromise. And sometimes I can envy people who have that like same friend group that they had their entire life or that, you know, just really belong in a place. And I realized that would be amazing, but I've chosen different experiences. And one of the upsides of that is I can feel home almost anywhere. One of the downsides of that is that I cannot feel fully at home anywhere. Wow, that's deeply and darkly poetic. <laughs> Do you feel at home? <sighs> Probably the way you put it is uh, really beautifully put. Yeah. No. I f have to find home in the people I love. Yeah. yeah. What advice would you give to young people uh, that look at your stellar life, the trajectory of of your career as a human being, as a creator, as a engineer, as a designer, as a incredibly interesting personality that, who's working on an autobiography? What <laughs> advice would you give them? Um, like how how to make their way in this life? Uh, maybe high school students, maybe college students on. Um, how they can have a career they can be proud of or a life they can be proud of. Oh my God, Lex. Mm. You know, it's, and this is not the advice, but there are very few moments in a career that feel as good as you think they are going to. And there are very few moments of feeling really proud of yourself. Like I feel like I often just feel like I'm not doing it well enough or big enough or, and now I just had one of those moments like hearing you say that. <laughs> I'm like, oh. I'm actually doing okay. Um, I think my main advice is enthusiasm is a much more potent fuel in life than duty. And just because something is boring doesn't mean that it's important. I kind of realized for myself that like I'm so much better at the things I enjoy. But school doesn't really teach us how to stay excited about something and how to stay enthusiastic about something. And if you can find that, then like you got a gold mine of potential. So I kind of had to reprogram myself to be like, just because this is fun doesn't mean that it's not important. Mm -hmm. Cause I had so much guilt about it in this weird way or where I'm like, no, this is too fun. This can't be work. And I'm like, no, it's still work. The boring stuff isn't more important. And the, the vice versa, as you said, just because it's boring and hard doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Yeah. That's interesting. I, um, I'm i gonna have to take that advice and think through it. Because I'm my genetically, I'm built a little bit like, if this is really unpleasant, it's probably good for me. Yeah. And it's and a it's dangerous just... thing to, to think. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not. Yeah. <laughs> no, and it's like, what comes really easy? And where do you have that kind of effortless momentum and enthusiasm? And that is kind of the sweet spot. I think that I'm also really happy that I spent time trying out so many different jobs. I mean, I had, I've had so many different jobs before I did it. And I would do things for a year and then I quit. And it feels like I tried on a bunch of different pants. And you're like, okay, I can kind of wear this, but they're like not super comfortable or I don't love the look of them or whatever. And now I feel like I found this pair of pants that just like fits me perfectly uh -huh. and that perfectly caters to my strengths and my weaknesses. Like I used to work as an editor for the Swedish government. And I remember thinking like, oh, I need to be okay that not a lot of things are happening and that things are moving slowly and that the work is kind of like monotonous. And then I realized like, or maybe I should be in a workplace where it's a benefit or strength that I want a lot of things to happen and that I can handle a high speed, Yeah, you know? And I think that is really such a good question to ask as well. Like what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And in what context are most of these things strengths? And if you're, Know that if you know the measurements, you can find the right fitting pants. Yeah, or the right suit, yeah. as Lex will tell you. Um, what do you think is the meaning of life? Oh, I don't think there's any meaning. It's, it's a meaningless void? No, just that it doesn't have any meaning doesn't mean that it's meaningless. 
I don't think that there's this big grand meaning. I think um, a more important question is what brings you substantial joy in your life. To me, it's the relationships with people that I have. Love? Yeah. I mean, love in all different kinds of form. It's... um, I'm really working on figuring out how to build more community, especially in a society that isn't really made for it. Um, I want more passive hangouts with people where, like, I just want people who are there. Together? To get high? No, together. <laughs> to get high? Maybe to together. Get high. Yeah. I mean, I like, I, I think seeing somebody for lunch and kind of shooting the shit and what's what's the latest with you is great. But like what I want is somebody to just roll up in sweatpants and open my fridge and like be like, what are you going to do? I don't know. Maybe I'll read a book. Like, yeah, I think so that... Sharing kind of like silence. Sharing silence, being alone together and that just that type of community, I think, is what I'm really seeking out now. Um because I think, yeah. And also like working on a goal, on a joint goal together with other people. You know, I think being a YouTuber can be really lonely. Um, I mean, as much as I'm working with a team, it's like, yeah, I just want to work in a bigger project and kind of have that sense of, wow, we're like doing this together. Because I think that accesses my pride a lot better than just being proud of myself. It's so much easier for me to be proud of a team than for me to be proud of myself. That's probably good advice for people who are doing creative work on YouTube too, to, yeah. to work on to work on a team. Yeah, and just choose, try to do things, <laughs> take it from the queen of shitty robots, but like try to do things with former integrity, queen. former queen of shitty robots. Do things with integrity. Like anything you do on the internet is kind of, I think of things as tattoos on my internet. And on my internet self, and I'm I'm really happy that I said no to some things early in my career that I know that I would have regretted now. And, you know, just think of it in the long term. Like, going viral is overwhelming and so stressful and so fun, but, like, so intense. And I'm, I'm really happy that I managed to build that into a more long-term career than just have it be something that passed. And come down from the the viral moment and maintain your humanity. Yeah. And also really deliberately defining what success means to you. Because there are so many reasons or so many definitions that other people will give you. And especially when you're working on the internet, there are just numbers upon numbers that are like, you're doing well, you're not doing well. And something I'm really happy that I did was early on, I really try to think of like, what does success look like for me? And I realized that it's not having the world's biggest YouTube channel. It's being proud of the projects that I put out and having full say in how I spend my time. Like that is the most important thing to me. And if I had a huge YouTube channel and I was making so much money, but I kind of had this machine run me rather than the other way around, like to me, it's so important to be able to wake up in the morning and be like, I don't want to do this anymore. And for that to be okay. Um, And I think I defined that for myself early on and I've really tried to live by it and made decisions after that. And I'm really happy that I did that. And also you're, with, with uh, the store, with the design you're doing now, you're putting a little bit of love in the products you create at mm-hmm. scale. I mean, that's what Johnny Ive did. Mm-hmm. That's the cool thing. So you can create something beautiful and then people can share that love at scale. Yeah, it's, it's terrifying and beautiful and I'm so here for it. <laughs> I'm here for it too. Uh, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of who you are. I'm a big fan of everything you do, of putting yourself out there, putting your love out there in terms of the designs you create. Also, just because I'm a fan of robotics, I think you inspire a lot of people. I think the shitty robots are actually incredible robots. Mm. And uh, it's incredible engineering. That's all, that's that's the best combination of design and engineering and fun, all of it together. So thank you for doing that. You're, you're, I'm a big fan. You're an inspiration. And thank you for sitting down with me. This is awesome. Thank you so much for having me.
Thanks for listening to this conversation with Simone Yetch. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, let me leave you with some words from Kurt Vonnegut. We have to continually be jumping off cliffs and developing our wings on the way down. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.